Hello everyone and welcome to episode 67 of the Potter Discussion. I'm your host Oscar and here on the Potter Discussion we discuss some of Harry Potter's deepest and darkest theories, tidbits, and little easter eggs you might have missed and you probably did. Whoa, so many things have been happening, and you probably have already noticed them. Episode 67, what is he saying? Well, I think I'm just going to address the episodes as their episode numbers in timeline order. So, this is episode 67, the next one will will be episode 68. I will still keep the seasons, because, you know, the season finale, the season premiere, and Time of the Quizmaster episodes, but I just feel like this shows more of a timeline progression, so I will keep the seasons, but I will call them by their, you know, wherever, (laughs) wherever the episode is. The second pretty big announcement is, I'm recording to a completely different audio interface, well, uh, editing workstation. And it is Adobe Audition. Boy, it's conv- <laughs> it's so confusing. And I'm sp- trying to figure it out still. And just looking at it, there are so many things moving at once. My brain's kind of melted. I was working in GarageBand before, so it was so simple. But now this is such a big jump. So it's just crazy. And the third absolutely ginormous announcement is this podcast is on YouTube. Wow, there it is. If maybe you're listening to this on YouTube, everyone on YouTube, hey, everyone listening on the podcast, because, man, that's so cool. It's two people. So, it's true. I am now have the podcast on the YouTube. It's still a podcast, don't worry, but it's just this kind of thing now. But... It is going to be a little different, so it, I don't have a camera, there's no face, but it's I'm posting a lot of stuff on YouTube, so if you want a little behind the scenes maybe, and some shorts, and some trailers, it's really cool. So if you want to go check that out, I'll put a link in the show notes or the description for the YouTube or podcast, depending on which one you want to go to if you prefer either style. So things are going pretty well in either end, I haven't really done anything, but... It's pretty cool, so that's a thing. But all that aside, we got a theory, and that theory is about the Goblet of Fire. You may know about this theory because I made a trailer on YouTube. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> so, yeah. And I was making this theory, and the question that drove it was, what happens if you are chosen by the Goblet of Fire and you just don't compete? Harry was faced with that exact dilemma. He was chosen by the Goblet of Fire, and he absolutely had to compete, but didn't want to. Of course he didn't. And he didn't even put himself in the Goblet of Fire, if that tells you anything. So if he didn't even want to, could he have just not compete? Like, just didn't go to the tasks? We never know. But it's kind of a strange thing with Harry, because if he didn't put his name in the Goblet... Is the contract with him? I don't know. But we will know after this theory. So stay tuned. But that was really long. So many announcements. Let's just get right into it. The Contract of Death. The Goblet of Fire is one of the most old and old-fashioned ways of picking contestants for the Triwizard Tournament. Three schools come together and provide a select few to compete in the Tri-Wizard Tournament. Historically, three champions are spat from the Goblet of Fire and bound in as a permanent contestant. But when oh-so-unlucky Harry finds his name coming out of the Goblet, Hogwarts is thrown into chaos. Harry was too young, too important, and the fourth competitor. There are only supposed to be three. Whatever should we do? Wait, I know. Potter should just sit by and watch, not participate. No, we'll leave it up to you, Barty. He knows the rule book back to front. The magical contract is binding. The boy must take his shot. Harry Potter is now an official contestant in the Tri Wizard Tournament. But Dumbledore clearly Potter just wants two bites at the apple. He didn't do it by himself. It would have 
be taking a powerful dark wizard to hoodwink the tri wizard drawing process. You seem to know a lot about this bad eye. Well, Igor, you all people should know it was once my job to think like dark wizards. Oh, whoops. Sorry. Let's get back to the theory at hand. Why is the Goblet of Fire so binding? A magical contract in the wizarding world can mean many things. What are some of the magical contracts? The most prominent would be the unbreakable vow. Two people wrap hands and swear to do something. Snape made an unbreakable vow with Narcissa to keep Draco safe in the sixth book. According to Harry Potter Wiki, an unbreakable vow was a type of binding magical contract between two parties that, if broken by either party, will result in imminent death of whoever broke the contract. But here is where things get spicy. A thin tongue of brilliant flame issued from the wand and wound its way around their hands like a red-hot wire. That's a quote from the sixth book in the article was describing uh, about the vow. If you caught the important part, good job, but here it is if you didn't. Fire. The unbreakable vow used fire to bind the two parties. Seems all too similar to the goblet of, wait for it, fire, question mark. Let's discuss. Fire is the constant in this scenario. In many religions, fire represents purification and eternity. That's what these kinds of vows are. Having fire as the binding substance would do many things. It would cause a bond that would be carried on for eternity. When an unbreakable vow is broken, the swearing parties die. Might we assume the same for the Goblet of Fire? Entering a pact of and for eternity is not taken lightly. An attempt to break out of something you reach to forever can't be overlooked. Ending the eternal bond results in the end of days, time, and the eternal life you set for yourself. Ending the time of your bond would be stopping the clock on your life. There you have it. I didn't know how that sounds. Also, te- technically and any other way, because I'm still trying to figure this out, but hopefully it sounds good enough. So that's the theory. And I just want to touch on a specific part of that, which was how you actually die. As if you... So the whole point of putting your name into the Goblet of Fire and having it being picked out means you are forced into the Tri-Wizard Tournament. And you would put your name in yourself. So if you were chosen... It's quite the risk, but it has a very big reward. And because uh, Barty Crouch Jr. put it in, put Harry's name in, he may have been at fault. So he tried to to manipulate Barty into, you know, saying that Harry has to compete. <gasps> Wait, did, did he say, like, Barty... Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at that scene again. I'll I'll get back to you in a second. I'm back from my fact checking journey, and no, it wasn't Barty or Mad Eye who said, "Oh, Barty, it's you." It was Dumbledore, but still, I think that Junior. I'm just gonna call him Junior. Junior did still have something to do with it because he and Igor were kind of going at it, like yep, 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 yep. So maybe he. I think. I am standing by my theory that Junior did know something. That the goblet, it isn't just a one and done, you can put your name in and Harry would be sent off without a second thought. But I think he knew that if Harry's name wasn't picked or they decided that Harry couldn't compete, then he would, something something pretty bad would happen to him because he put the name in. So I think Junior was trying to manipulate the situation 
even if he didn't know exactly what was going to happen, I think he knew that something bad was in store for him if he didn't follow through on his promise. And not only from Voldemort, but also from the Goblet of Fire. And that could have been another contributor to the fact that he was trying to get Harry to put the... So, well, he put the name in and he was trying to get Harry to compete. So that's, a, that's just another layer of him trying to motivate someone else to put Harry into a situation where Voldemort would have that access to him. So it's pretty cool to think that Junior was, you know, in on the secret and he knew something about it. But that also means that he is really, 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 really powerful because he, he said himself... I, I, as I was watching this scene, I was laughing at his lines because it's always really funny. He's like, oh, man, I just watched it. How, how, how did I forget? He was like, the the Goblet of Fire is an, is an exceptionally powerful dark object, so an exceptionally powerful dark wizard would have to enchant it or something like that. And he said it's so fast and, like, so gruff. I just, like, it's the... They're just some characters' lines that I just laugh at every time, and Moody's lines is one of them, but also when Junior is talking to Voldemort, like, as himself, but Moody has some great lines, um, you know, in, in, in his vast experience, he has some pretty funny, uh, pretty funny whatevers, but still, okay, that's completely off topic, but still, I had to, I just had to say it, <laughs> but, yeah, I think... It's just really interesting to think that these magical objects have a defense system in place. So, the Goblet of Fire has, you know, you're probably going to die if you put your name in your chosen. You're like, oh, what? I was, you know, just, you know, whatever. I don't want to do that. And there are some, there are also some dark objects that have that same defense system. It's a little more obvious for those dark objects because they are just that, dark objects. But for the Goblet of Fire, it's strange to think that once you put your name in, Dumbledore said, you can you cannot have cold, like, you literally cannot have cold feet. So, Dumbledore and a couple others are the only ones in on the secret that the Goblet of Fire is binding. And if you don't, you know, actually compete, that's kind of bad for you. But back to the first topic of discussion about how, like, how you would actually die. It's kind of a, a an issue of logic, and that's really what comes down to a lot of these theories. How would you die? How would the Goblet of Fire manage to kill you? I think it isn't the Goblet of Fire specifically. I don't think the Goblet of Fire senses when you don't do something and then it like shoots out a jet of flame and kills you. I think it does something in the sense of logic. So it, it isn't like predicting where you're going to go and puts a bear trap there. No. You get killed by the Goblet of Fire by you breaking something that should last forever. And your life is forever. For you, that is your reality. So stopping your forever makes it clear that you cannot continue in your own reality of eternity. So in a sense, you are ending your life when you stop participating in something that should last for as long as your reality spans. And that's kind of confusing, but I've been thinking about this for a while. When you enter that pact, you are saying, I will do this forever. And as long as I live, this will be true. When you stop that pact, one, your eternity ends. So your forever can no longer continue. And you broke a very severe magical contract, resulting in all kind of repercussions. So having those two combined, your end of reality and all the repercussions amounts to the paramount, which is death. And that's why when you decide that you don't want to participate in the in the vow of eternity that you agree to, that's it. 
you cannot continue to exist in your ended reality. So, your reality ends, and your forever stops. Wow, this is going to be a very interesting summary in the description, but that's basically it. When you, I'm going to say it one more time for good measure, you make a vow for eternity. When you Again, when you fail to participate in that vow, it is your end of eternity, your end of forever. And your because your reality is your entire life, that is your eternity. That is your forever. Stopping that eternity forever will be stopping your life as well because it is tied so tightly to your forever, to your eternity. Oof, that was like my... Einstein is going to be proud of me. Man, that was so much logic. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out. But I will let that mull over. This has been episode 67. First episode on YouTube. Fourth video, but still. Man, that was so fun. And this is on YouTube. I, Man, I'm still thinking about it. That this is not only on podcasts, this is on the YouTube. So this is so cool. But I don't have to cut it short, not exactly, but I'm going to have to cut it there. That's my, this, this is my end of the episode. <laughs> if you have any questions, comments, or theories that you would like to hear on the podcast, you could definitely send me an email. My email is thepotterdiscussion at gmail.com. That is thepotterdiscussion at gmail.com. If you could just scroll down there, tap subscribe to the podcast or the YouTube channel to you can never miss another episode. That would be fantastic. If you have any suggestions, you could leave a review on podcast, an Apple podcast or Podchaser. Five stars, please. You know, it's not that hard. And you can also leave a comment on YouTube. Tell me what you think I should do for the next episode or improvements you would like me to make. If you want my ultimate guide to a perfect Harry Potter marathon where I give you my two favorite Easter eggs from every book or movie, click that first link in the show notes or description and enter your first name and email and you are in for free. That is the end of the episode. This probably isn't going to be the best one, but I'll I'll, I'll get better at Adobe Audition, so bear with me here. Use this information to your advantage and I will see you later.